Hello everybody. Welcome to the third, and probably last, installment in my Seated High Score series. Last time, I played Ironclad, and earned a nice, tidy sum of 4,000 points, including almost every score bonus that was possible at the time. Now, after some recent developments, I switch to the new character, Watcher, and this time I will earn 7,052 points, an improvement of over 3,000 points from my last run. How did we go from 4,000 points to 7,000? Part of it is the introduction of Act 4, the hidden true ending of the game, but by itself that adds fewer than 1,000 points, even when played perfectly. As for the rest of the points, it's all down to the new Watcher card, Wish. If that doesn't make sense yet, don't worry. I'll explain later how we wish for points. Act 1 is whizzing by, making it difficult for me to talk about exactly what is happening. This is mostly because I have planned out exactly what to do for at least the start of almost every fight in the game. Prior to this recorded run, I made several passes through the seat, backing up saves periodically, and planning a route through fights and decisions to avoid taking any damage against elite fights and bosses. After all, flawless elite fights give 50 points each on Ascension 20, and are a huge contributor to any high-scoring run. Then, I used these notes I made to record one final playthrough. This is what you're watching now. But even after my preparation, things did not always go smoothly in my run-through attempts. The Three Centuries fight here is an example of one rough spot. Through some experimentation, I had found earlier that when using a colorless potion after a power potion in the fight, the colorless potion would give me apotheosis. That copy of apotheosis would then carry the rest of the fight pretty easily. Without apotheosis, however, I would probably need a very different route through the first half of the act in order to get a flawless fight. Unfortunately, when I started trying to record complete runs, I was doing exactly what my notes said to do in this fight, and I couldn't replicate the simple sequence of Power Potion for Mental Fortress, and then Colorless Potion for Apotheosis. Five times in a row, I got an identical set of cards from the Colorless Potion, which did not contain Apotheosis. It turns out, there's a bug in the game affecting discovery actions, those actions where you choose between three different cards. Although the cards you get from the discovery are properly seeded, meaning you'll get the same ones every time, the discovery action then increments the state of the random number generator by an additional amount. This amount is affected by the game's frames per second setting and additional circumstances beyond my control. The same bug affects a few other fights in the run, but in ways that could be worked around. The Sentry's fight was the only fight where I just had to hope I got the desired outcome. Otherwise, I started over from the beginning of the run. Luckily, the fight occurred early in the run, so it wasn't too much of a hassle to keep restarting. I could also have just saved and reloaded the fight until obtaining the desired result. However, for all of my seated high score runs, I've tried to keep them in one take, free of what I would consider to be an exploit. And I have always considered that save scumming is such an exploit even if it doesn't really give an advantage in the seated run. Anyway, even despite this discovery bug, this run required far fewer attempts than my ironclad runs, which I believe required much more precise sequences of actions in order to win some fights throughout the run. 
Now, we're already a fair bit into the run. The first thing that happened, way back at the beginning, was a boss relic trade, where we swapped the Watcher starter relic for Pandora's box. The cards we got from this aren't actually amazing, but when combined with the first few card rewards from fights, they are still good enough for perfect elite fights. In fact, I consider Pandora's box to be one of the strongest relics you can get from trading your starting class relic to Niao. By the end of the game, however, I will have removed most of the cards that I got from the box, as they do not end up synergizing with my particular late game strategy. Notably, two of the cards we started with, which I will remove, are a nice card combo for early Lagavulin fights. Worship in Sands of Time. Worship is a card that allows us to use Lagavulin's sleeping phase to set up a turn in Divinity Stance. Divinity Stance is one of the three special Watcher stances, and although it is the most powerful, it is the one we will see the least this run. It triples the damage of all the attacks and gives three energy when entered. Sands of Time is the perfect card to get its damage tripled, as it has a hefty base damage and is always retained in our hand. As we saw in the Gremlin Knob in Sentry's fights though, even when doubled by Wrath Stance, the damage of Sands of Time is still fearsome. Now seems like a good time to talk about things actually currently happening in the run. Three important cards that I picked up at the end of Act 1 are Lesson Learned, Wish, and Fasting. I was just offered an upgraded copy of Fasting, but it was important to take Wallop instead for that reward. Wallop is needed to block some big hits from Act 2 Elites. Now the joke goes, that picking up Philosopher's Stone is guaranteed to summon the birds at the start of Act 2. I guess this run is no exception. Luckily, the bird fight can be handled without taking damage. However, I do decide to take 10 damage from the last bird in order to play Wish for 30 extra gold. I then finish the bird off with Lesson Learned, upgrading a random card from my deck. I will be upgrading a card with Lesson Learned in almost every fight this run. Wish, however, won't be used for gold in many elite fights. I just don't need the gold, and I can get more than enough from regular fights. The gold from the birds fight, however, was necessary. Without it, I would be left with less than 75 gold after this shop. The old beggar event cannot show up with less than 75 gold, so having less than 75 would result in me facing the masked bandits event instead of the nest. Fighting the bandits then changes the card RNG for the rest of the run, preventing me from obtaining the cards I need later in the act. Not fighting the bandits loses me a lot of gold. I also haven't bought cards from shops since I picked up the Courier Relic for the same reason. It changes future card rewards. Now the Augmenter, or Drug Dealer, is the last event I encountered in the first half of Act 2. There, I made sure to transform Sanctity as my first card in order to get a copy of Fear No Evil, which is a very important card for the rest of this run. Transforming Vigilance allowed me to obtain another copy of Just Lucky, which I was also pretty happy with given my strategy this run. Now I just want to make a quick note about this Book of Stabbing fight. It shows why we picked up Wallop, which was needed to block on turn 1. It is also, in my opinion, the first fight where you can really see the strategy of the deck start to come together. And I'll talk more about that later, but there's just a few relevant things that have been happening more recently. 
At the last shop, we just bought a membership card. While the discount it provides is not at all necessary for this high score run, I am glad it showed up at some point within the seed, as it will save a lot of time later by reducing the amount of gold I need to acquire. What is necessary, however, is Prismatic Shard, picked up at this shop. With Prismatic Shard, copies of other class cards, and specifically Nightmare, will start to show up in the run as card rewards. I will need two copies of Nightmare before the end of Act 3. Bag of Preparation is also nice to have, especially in a run where consistent turn 1s are so important so as to not lose any health in elite fights. And the only reason I brought the Strike Potion was to manipulate Potion RNG. I won't ever actually use the Strength Potion. Earlier, I mentioned how the Discovery Bug made the Sentry's fight inconsistent. Well, this fight against the three slavers on 425 was the other main fight affected by the Discovery Bug. Depending on how much the RNG is progressed after taking Scrawl from the Skill Potion, Tantrum shuffles itself into different spots in the draw pile. I needed to route two different methods of finishing this fight while upgrading a card with Lesson Learned and while taking no damage. The RNG experienced in this run required the route that finishes the fight in two turns. However, my original notes finish the fight in just one turn. Okay, now back to the strategy I used for winning fights in this seed. If you haven't played the Watcher before, one of her main mechanics is her stances, represented by a colorful visual effect surrounding the character. Wrath Stance is the red stance, doubling damage both taken and dealt for as long as I remain in Wrath Stance. Calm Stance is the blue stance, giving me two energy whenever I exit the stance. So, starting from Wrath Stance, every time I switch to Calm Stance and then switch back to Wrath Stance, I gain two energy. I have two ways of entering Wrath Stance for the cost of one energy, Tantrum and Eruption. And as of a few floors ago, I have one repeatable way of entering Calm Stance that costs one energy. Fear no evil. So, playing Tantrum, followed by Fear no evil, costs zero net energy and deals damage. All I need then for gigantic combos is a free way to draw cards, and that's where Rushdown comes in. I have three copies of the Rushdown power at this point in the run, which lets me draw two cards every time I enter Wrath Stance per copy of Rushdown in play. Altogether, this basic three card combo is a decent package to look for when you're playing Watcher. The method used to enter Calm is interchangeable. I use Fear No Evil in this run, but Inner Peace is another good option even though I couldn't find a copy. Inner Peace is probably even better than Fear No Evil since it is not conditional in the way that it switches from Wrath Stance to Calm Stance. Tranquility and Crescendo are good as cheap one-time stance changers and can help you get going or even generate some free energy along the way. Tantrum, which I have, is the best way to enter Wrath Stance, especially since it shuffles itself into the draw pile before Rushdown activates and draws some cards, often causing Tantrum to draw itself again. With a small enough deck or enough ways to cycle, this combo does go infinite, though as this run shows, you don't need to go infinite to be more than prepared to win all of your fights. And we also do pick up some of the cards that go really well with the core strategy. Zero cost cards are great with all of the free card draw I get from Rushdown. 
Fasting trades one energy per future turn for a large amount of immediate dexterity and strength. This is great when A, I'm usually winning so quickly that I don't even miss the lost energy, and B, almost every strength or dexterity scaling card in my deck is essentially free to play. The main power I'm missing this run is Mental Fortress. Mental Fortress would let me gain 4 block every time I change stances, or 6 block when upgraded. With how much I'm changing stances this run, that's a ton of block. Still though, who needs to block when you kill everything so quickly it can't fight back? That's the speedrun philosophy at least. Well, we've said goodbye to that strength potion I bought, but the power potion is what I really wanted. I'm going to need it late in Act 3, though using the route from this attempt, there actually is another power potion later that I can pick up before I need it. Ceramic Fish was kind of a convenience relic to buy. It gives 9 gold every time I add a card to my deck, and in normal circumstances, I wouldn't buy such a weak effect at the shop, even with the super discount from Courier plus membership card. But if you're buying thousands of cards like I will, that's thousands of gold saved. And Mummified Hand, from that earlier Elite, is one of those relics where, if I was playing normally, I would feel my chances of winning this run just skyrocket once I get it. Because Mummified Hand makes a random card in my hand cost zero whenever I play a power, cards like Fasting and Wish are going to become much easier to play. Mummified Hand is generally extra good in seated runs, or if you're save scumming, since you can manipulate the discount onto exactly the cards you want to be playing for free. But there's theory, and then there's my lazy notes. The notes I used for this attempt weren't always that detailed about exactly what to do. In this bronze automaton fight, I played slowly, trying to remember which cards I needed to discard with acrobatics in order to get convenient discounts from Mummified Hand. Unfortunately, I remembered wrong. And because my notes said I needed to play Wish for gold in this fight, I decided to squeeze it in and hope for the best. After all, having different amounts of gold can prevent me from buying key items at shops, or even change which events spawn throughout the run. But because I deviated from the script, and as you'll soon see, because I then made a series of stupid decisions and mismanaged my remaining energy, I found myself left in a position where I could either take damage from the boss, or I could use my stance potion. Neither choice actually dooms the run. I encounter five bosses in a complete run, and I only need to defeat three without taking damage to earn the maximum score bonus. The heart fight will definitely not be perfect, but that still leaves room to take damage from Bronze Automaton. On the other hand, my route includes the use of a stance potion on floor 42 but I figure there's probably a way around that, especially if I buy some additional potions in Act 3. Ultimately, I decide to use the Stance Potion. As for this attempt, I had thrown in a last minute change for card choices at the end of Act 3, and I wanted some leeway on the Act 3 bosses just in case that made it impossible to get perfect fights. Seeing as I wouldn't be fighting the Act 3 bosses for over two hours, I strongly preferred to take the course of action where I would find out if I needed to reset in less than 10 minutes. You know what? Let me go on an unscripted tangent about scripts. 
If there's one thing I've learned from doing all of these high score runs, it's that following a long script is surprisingly hard, especially if you want to do it smoothly. I have this whole list of directions of exactly what I need to do in every fight, from beginning to maybe like halfway through. And somehow, when I start playing these fights, my brain turns off as I'm following these scripts, and then I end up halfway through the fight, and my brain turns on, and where am I? Uh, I look back, and now I've lost my place in the script, and whoo, it's not smooth anymore. It's kind of the same thing, reading from the script of commentary. You know, I wrote like an hour of commentary for this run. Not this part, but pretty much everything else. Reading a paragraph of that commentary, like two to three minutes, and then not stumbling over my words and deciding to do another take, that's hard. I'm in awe of these people that release 10, 20 minute videos in one take that just sounds super smooth and super natural. Certainly sounds better than my three minute commentary takes, in my opinion. But yeah, I am running through the script of exactly what to do in a fight, and then I make a mistake. Just do what my instincts say to do instead of what the script says to do for two seconds, and I've lost. And it's easy to not be able to recover from that. I guess it's a lot easier for this Watcher run, but I also s scripted a lot less on this Watcher run compared to the Ironclad run, and I practiced a lot less for this Watcher run compared to the Ironclad run, and I think it shows a little bit, but yeah, that's my, my little tangent about scripts. But back to the regularly scheduled commentary. At least on my side, that dumb mistake against Bronze Automaton definitely added a bit of tension to the run. In the last shop, I spent a long time trying to decide what to buy to fix this mistake. I was trying to remember the 442 Nemesis fight and work out what sort of purchase would maximize my chances of getting through it without taking damage. I could buy a bunch of potions with Courier. But would that be less effective without Potion Belt? Especially since I know I really need to hang on to a Power Potion. And what about Preserved Insect? Do I need it for my Act 3 Perfect Elite Fights? I can't remember. Ultimately though, I decide to buy the Power Potion and hope for the best outcome. And, by the way, this Act 3 shop I visited was a pretty late addition to the route. The seed search tool I used originally passed me through an event instead of that shop, but it turns out that visiting the shop allows me to obtain 25 more points by the end of the run. And then, after the shop, there was the Mind Bloom event. I decided to take the 999 gold option instead of fighting an Act 1 boss for an extra rare relic. From some testing, it turns out that fighting the boss would generate an extra card reward, ultimately resulting in me not getting my second copy of Nightmare later in Act 3. On the other hand, since I do have Omomori, Taking two copies of Normality is not a problem. And now, we've come to the transient fight. This is one battle where the Watcher tends to excel. Her Wrath Stance doubles the damage dealt, which against the transient essentially also translates to double defense. And the downside of Wrath Stance where you take twice as much damage from attacks doesn't matter at all when the transient is attacking for zero damage. So, it wouldn't be much trouble at all to play a couple attacks each turn and let the transient fade away after six turns. But I've got lesson learned. 
if I kill the transient with it, I get to upgrade a card. So I'm sorry that this is going to take a few minutes, but I'm upgrading a card. As I think they said in Pokemon, Gotta upgrade them all, lesson learned and me. I know it's my destiny, gotta upgrade them all. And I'll get there. At least temporarily, until Act 4. But to do it, I decided to go for even more style points and pull off a turn 2 kill. This is also the big demonstration this run of my deck's huge combo power, after everything is set up at least. The wishes are played for strength to speed up the process, and to get them out of the way since I will be regularly filling up my hand. Those copies of Tranquility that I picked up? They're essentially free energy now, and I use them when I need to enter Calm Stance but did not manage to draw my copy of Fear No Evil. But mostly, I scry to make sure Tantrum draws Fear No Evil. Then I play the Fear No Evil plus Tantrum combo over and over, working in as much free damage as I can along the way. The melange that I picked up at the shop really helps make this possible, as missing Fear No Evil a couple more times would have pushed my turn 2 kill back to at least turn 3. Along with my third copy of Acrobatics, I find a weak potion from the Transient. Entering that fateful floor 42 fight against the Nemesis, I'm now hopeful about my chances. When routing the seed, I did usually not buy the power potion in Act 3, so I didn't expect to get a weak potion from the Transient. Would that weak potion be enough to block the Transient's turn 1? I foolishly thought that I would draw a block card from Rushdown and it would suffice. So, I waited until the last moment to play my power potion, even though there was no reason at all to save my power potion. This removed Rushdown, Fasting, Mental Fortress, and Nirvana as possible outs to avoid damage. Truly, this run was not an exemplary example of my decision-making and disastery recovery abilities. But, to demonstrate that poor play can be overcome by exceptional luck, my use of Mummified Hand accidentally manipulated the Power Potion into giving me Like Water as my first card option, which was, in fact, the only power that could still save me. And, you know, getting lucky is exciting, right? If I never made any mistakes, I would have less to talk about here, so really, everybody wins. In the end, I'm glad I didn't decide to spend time starting the seed over and over until I got a run-through I was 100% happy with. Okay, enough self-justification. It's time to talk about randomness in Slay the Spire, since I often get questions about how seeds work. It all starts with a random number generator, or RNG, which is a confusing acronym, because when talking about games, RNG has evolved to basically mean randomness. But technically, in video games, there isn't actually a random number generator, but a pseudo-random number generator. It's called pseudo-random because for every starting state, it produces a deterministic sequence of random-looking numbers. This can be an advantage for games, because it allows for random behavior to be reproducible. The starting state of a random number generator is initialized using some piece of information, which we call a seed, usually a number. So to review, 
For the same seed, the pseudo random number generator always produces the same sequence of random numbers. For Slay the Spire, when you enter some letters and numbers as the game's seed, they are converted into a 64-bit integer, which is used to initialize all of the game's random number generators. In total, there's around 18 quintillion possible seats. And yes, earlier, when I said random number generators, I did mean generators, plural. Slay the Spire uses the run seed to seed 13 random number generators, each with their own use cases and quirks about how and when they are initialized. A big reason for this is probably to make runs of the same seed more consistent. The RNG in charge of enemy AI is only used for enemy AI. So two players running the same seed will see the same behavior from the boss, even if they play different randomly acting cards in combat. There are two broad categories of how the different RNGs are initialized. AI RNG is one of the many random number generators which are freshly initialized each floor so spending longer in one fight will not affect the next. The others in this category are MISC RNG, mostly used for randomness within events, Monster HP RNG, Shuffle RNG, and Card Random RNG, which is used for the random effects in combat not covered by the other RNGs. The rest of the random number generators are those that are only freshly initialized at the start of the run or the start of each act, so different choices made on one floor can affect what happens on future floors. For example, card RNG is in charge of which cards you get from card rewards and is reinitialized at the start of every act. So in most circumstances, the first card reward of the act will be the same for everybody, but card rewards later on might diverge depending on what choices are made. Now we have come to possibly the most important fight in the game. It's time to farm some gold. From Giant Head, I obtained a second copy of Nightmare, and when used at the start of this fight, my power potion gave me a copy of Deva form. Combined with the copies of Nightmare and Wish from the first two boss fights, all the pieces of the combo have come together. First though, I kill off all but one spiker to simplify the fight. I'm really taking my time here to make sure that everything is working out properly in this fight, because I do have some setup constraints. First. I need to make sure to leave one copy of Tranquility unplayed, as it will help me avoid drawing cards later by filling up my hand. Second, I'm trying to get both copies of Nightmare and Wish together in one hand, so that I don't have to try and make it happen later, when I don't want to be attacking with Tantrum to trigger the card draw from Rushdown, potentially killing the enemies and hurting myself. Then. I can start making copies of Nightmare and Wish. And of course, I still want to upgrade a card with Lesson Learned, so I do that too. Technically, it may be possible to upgrade up to four cards in this fight, but with almost all the cards in my deck already upgraded, I decide not to bother doing so. Now, with everything set up, I play Nightmare targeting Nightmare and Nightmare targeting Wish. The effect of Nightmare will then give me three copies of Nightmare and three copies of Wish in my next hand, before my normal card draw occurs. Playing just one copy of Wish for plated armor permanently inoculates me against the spiker's attacks. And although in very old patches of the game I would have been worried about spiker's thorns scaling out of control, they now stop scaling after being used just six times, so 19 thorns is the maximum on Ascension 20. Anyway, all concerns have been taken care of, and I'm free to start farming for gold. The first step 
is basically just to wait for Devaform to give me enough energy to play three copies of Nightmare and six copies of Wish every turn. But even while setting this up, I, al I can already demonstrate how the combo for infinite gold works. I make sure to Nightmare on Nightmare and Wish every turn, even if I cannot play the copies of Wish, just so I don't have to collect the necessary cards in one hand ever again. But gradually, I start to have enough energy to play Nightmare twice on Wish and once on Nightmare, for three copies of Nightmare and six copies of Wish every turn. At the beginning, I can't play all of these copies of Wish, but eventually, Devaform will take care of this problem, and I will be able to gain 180 gold each turn. That's 30 per Wish, times 6 copies of Wish. One note I'd like to make is that Devaform was not an absolute requirement to power the energy for infinite gold. A similar effect could have been obtained with Madness, or Berserk, or Enlightenment, or even Sneko Eye. Similarly, Double Nightmare is the most convenient method to infinitely copy Wish. But the three card combo of Nightmare Exhume Wish also leads to infinite gold. If you're ironclad, you can even use one copy of Wish along with any method to repeatedly generate Exhume. None of these alternatives, though, are quite as convenient as what I did, so I'm glad I could make Devaform Nightmare Nightmare Wish work with this seed. The amount of gold I really needed for this high score run is probably somewhere around 50,000. However, for extreme safety's sake, I decided to farm at least 100,000 gold. This is totally possible to do by hand, and there's even very little risk in messing anything up in an unrecoverable way, although it would be mind-numbingly boring. So, I wrote a script to do it for me while I went out to dinner, and even sped up 50 times. I didn't want to make you sit through a few minutes of that, so I just edited it out and showed you two turns of what you were missing. If for whatever reason you want to see the complete, uncut recording session that contains this run, and I don't think you're missing much, I've added a link in the description of this video. Anyway, at the end of all of that farming, and almost 120,000 gold richer, I killed the spiker to end the fight. I took some damage, but who cares? I was ready to move on with my run and I didn't want to find my copy of Wallop to just save a few meaningless HP. To return to the discussion about randomness, generally speaking, there are two main ways to manipulate RNG in this game. The first method is to find a way to advance the state of the relevant random number generator. Often, the ways of doing this are fairly limited, for card RNG, you can take a card from Niao, or fight a different number of enemies. As another example, each time you play Alchemize, you advance the Potion RNG. Generally, granular advances that let you really get a desired outcome for card rewards are limited. Sometimes, though, playing cards increments card RNG instead of card random RNG in combat changing future card rewards. In my Ironclad high score run, I took advantage of this behavior with Havoc to get more collector bonuses. In the current patch, you can do the same with Foreign Influence, though I didn't discover this until I started running Watcher Seeds. In fights, we often manipulate RNG by advancing the state of the random number generator. There's so many random effects and fights, and most of them share card random RNG to handle the randomness. So, if you want a different power from your power potion, try playing a power and proccing Mummified Hand first. Or, if you're defect, let your lightning orbs strike some random targets. 
There's so many ways to manipulate the randomness in fights, at least once you get enough sources of randomness. This is part of why saving and reloading fights makes the game so much easier, and it's why I have notes I use to play this run, even when the core strategy of the deck is easy to execute. I often wanted my mummified hand procs to hit specific cards to make the fights a little bit smoother. Anyway, advancing the state of the random number generator is one way to manipulate RNG, but another big one is to manipulate the pool used for random selection. A big example of this is in choosing events. When you enter an event, Suppose the game decides to give you a shrine, which is the rarer of the two pools of events you can get. Then, it adds all shrines you're eligible for to a list, and gives you a random element of that list. But there's a lot of conditional shrines. The Fountain of Curse Removal doesn't show up unless you have a removable curse. Secret Portal doesn't show up until 800 seconds have elapsed and a whole bunch of events require you to have enough gold to afford them. So if one run you have 100 gold and encounter the Gremlin Wheel event, you'll probably encounter something completely different on the same seed if you show up with zero gold. For this current run, I've already mentioned several times about manipulating my gold total for this reason. Manipulating the pools used for random selection does come up in other places as well. Earlier, I chose specific cards to transform to get a specific pool of possible outcomes. And I've been talking about Mummified Hand a lot, but it is easily manipulated by changing hand size. Other than events though, manipulating RNG through changing the pool is relatively rare. Notably, relics are generated in a fixed order for each rarity at the beginning of a run to keep things more consistent. So despite relic spawn sometimes being conditional, for example, you can't get bottled lightning without a non-basic skill, it's hard to dramatically change the order of relics you get in a run. Other aspects of seeds are even more fixed than relics. The map layout, bosses, and order of monster spot in each act are currently impossible to manipulate in any known way, even by choosing a different character. We're coming up to the end of Act 3, and my biggest disappointment of the run. I said earlier that I made a last minute routing change. That was to take feed right before the bosses. I don't need the maximum HP, though it could speed things up a tiny bit in Act 4. But I really did want to finish Donu off with feed for the Ooh Donut style points. Unfortunately, when the moment came, I looked at my copy of feed, saw lethal, and fed on DECA without thinking. Quite the missed opportunity. But oh well, we've made it to Act 4, with 120,000 gold and a full deck of upgraded cards. After passing over that beautiful, unusable rest site, it's finally time to shop. The first thing I do in the shop is buy exactly 139 cards. This is the last RNG manipulation done this run. Each time a card is bought with Courier, the next number from card RNG is used to determine the rarity of the replacement card. Over the course of the run so far, we have picked up three copies of Acrobatics. By buying exactly 139 cards from the Act 4 shop before purchasing Orrery, I can force Orrery to offer me my fourth copy of Acrobatics in its first card reward. By completing my collection of four copies of Acrobatics, 
I earn 25 additional points. This is also why I said that visiting the Act 3 shop earns me 25 additional points. If I didn't visit that shop, Orrery would not have been offered for sale in Act 4. Theoretically, I could even go further and try to obtain two out-of-class collector bonuses from the Act 4 Orrery. Practically speaking, Given the enormous pool of cards available through Prismatic Shard, getting two bonuses seemed infeasible. As a happy accident, Orrery did not offer a single rare card. Due, the, due to the peculiarities of how rarity generation works in Slay the Spire, this greatly increased the chances of rare cards for the rest of the shopping session drastically reducing the number of cards I needed to buy to obtain complete collections. After buying Orrery, I decided to buy out the rest of the relics from the shop. After a certain point, I ran out of relics to buy and was offered only circlets. The circlet is the relic the game gives you when it can't give you any other relic. If you play an endless run for long enough, you are likely to pick up a large number of circlets, but it is very difficult to ever encounter them outside of endless mode. In past patches, I have done it using the Knowing Skull plus Bloody Idol combination to obtain thousands of gold. Here, buying out the relics hardly even makes a dent in my gold total. There are still many relics that I do not own, however, despite buying out the shop. Courier can't restock shop-only relics, so I am missing a number of those. All of the relics I passed over at previous shops are also unable to show up again. And finally, a large portion of the relic pool cannot show up after a certain point in the run so as to avoid giving the player useless relics from a late game dig or the Act 4 Elite. I do kind of wish that I could have gotten an egg though, since my perfectly upgraded deck has been ruined by all of these purchased cards. After buying relics, I continued to potions. The Watcher has a default starting HP of 72. To obtain the score bonus, Stuffed, worth 50 points, I need to raise this maximum HP by 30 to 102. To do so, I simply needed to use Courier to dig for fruit juice potions. Because of feed, and the large number of max HP relics I picked up, this doesn't take very long. Unfortunately, it is also ultimately useless. There is a bug in the game preventing the Watcher from obtaining score bonuses from maximum HP on runs where she kills the Harp. Somehow, it seems nobody discovered this bug until me after I had already sunk effort into searching for a suitable seed and routing such a seed all the way to the heart kill. I hoped the devs would fix this bug quickly so I could get another free 50 points, but it still hasn't happened. Either way, I obtained enough HP for the stuffed score bonus just for the principle of it. If it weren't for a bug in the game, I should have 50 more points for 7,102 points this run. With potions and relics out of the way, I move on to cards. For the maximum possible score, I need four copies of every Watcher card and every Colorless card. I started by buying class skills, since they are the shop category with the largest number of cards. The merchant always stocks two Colorless cards and five class cards, two attacks, two skills, and one power. If you have the Courier and buy one of these cards, it is always replaced by another card in the same category. 
So by rapidly clicking in the same spot, and yes, I am using an auto clicker to make it easier on me, I can buy over a thousand watcher skills. I don't want to stop until I get four copies of each one, but I also can't know I have four copies without checking because the class cards you get from courier restocks are not seeded in the sense that different playthroughs of the same game seed will give different cards, although the rarity will stay the same. So that's why I buy far more cards than I really need to buy, and that's why I check the deck screen after buying my cards. I'm really only looking at the rare sets since they are the least likely to be completed. After I'm done buying Watcher skills, I move on to Watcher attacks, then Watcher powers, and finally colorless cards. For colorless cards, I even go overboard and buy far, far more than are required. I suppose I do need enough copies of Mind Blast to consistently draw copies for each of the first four turns against the heart. But that doesn't take that many copies of Mind Blast. Anyway, I suppose if you've got the gold, why not spend it? That's also why I end up springing for a hundred circlets at the end of my shopping session. Well, that's about all I can say about the shop. As we near the end of this run, I'd like to look back and talk about the score bonuses we obtained, the ones we didn't obtain, and what is theoretically possible. The seed used, J2RWKB, or seed number 1,002,070,311, was the best seed I found after searching through hundreds of millions of Watcher seeds. But comparing this run to the 4,000 point ironclad run, you can immediately see that this run is still not perfect. Without a single curse on my deck, I have no hope of obtaining the cursed bonus of 100 points. And while the ironclad seed fought the maximum of 16 elites without entering Act 4, this Watcher run will only fight 15. These supposed point losses come from just how rare it is to find Prismatic Shard followed by specific cross-class rares. And also, seeds where you can fight more than 15 elites are so rare, I didn't find a single one that also contained all the cards I needed. And the Curses score bonus is further also impossible in many seeds, including the one I chose. But what if we look past all practical concerns and theorycraft the highest possible score with perfect luck? I believe I have the answer to that question. We need to play Ironclad for the most non-basic class cards and a working stuffed bonus. Then we trade our starting relic to Niao for Calling Bell, which gives us Courier and Old Coin. On 4-2, we encounter the only shop before Act 4, where we buy Prayer Wheel and Prismatic Shard. We then get perfect maps to visit at least 15 question mark nodes, all of which are fights. 5 elites in Act 1, 5 elites in Act 2, and 6 elites in Act 3 using Winged Boots. From the Act 1 boss reward, we find Cursed Key, and opening the chests in Act 2 and Act 3 gives us 2 copies of Parasite. Two Writhing Mass encounters in Act 3 provide two more copies of Parasite. Somewhere before the Act 2 campfire, we find Dreamcatcher and rest for at least two additional card rewards. And the Act 4 shop happens to have Orrery for five more card rewards, giving us enough cross-class card rewards for 17 additional collector bonuses, plus the one from Parasite. Altogether, the best I can come up with is a theoretical maximum of 7,893 points. All that being said, 7,052 points, or 7,102 points if I wasn't robbed by a bug, is not a bad score. I'll certainly take it, at least for now. Especially with what I've learned while putting together this run, 
I'm sure the score can be pushed at least a little bit further. It's not quite as crazy optimized as the 4000 point ironclad run was at the time. But regardless, I hope you enjoyed watching this run. Thanks to Megacrit for making this game, and adding Wish, giving me a chance to show off another side of Slay the Spire high score runs. And with that, I'll leave you with the run history screen. Thanks again for watching. Goodbye.